I'm going to be talking to Alison Thompson, who's the chair of the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association, or CANGEA, about the Alberta Energy Regulator's completion of the regulatory framework for geothermal resource development. So welcome to the interview, Alison. Thanks, Mark. I mean, it's so nice to be speaking to you about um, something about the future. You and I just met during the Energy Futures Lab engagement a few years ago, and here we are still talking about the future. So let's make it happen today. Well, that's a, it's an occupational hazard in my business to talk about the future, and there's always lots of future to get to. So uh, let's, uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of the of what the Alberta Energy Regulator has done, can you give us a, a brief overview, some context about where geothermal is in Alberta? Sure, and I think this really goes back to uh, political goals, or maybe they're politicians' goals, maybe they're ministry goals, you know, versus regulator. And uh, I, I think that there's not been enough conversation between the people who are going to you know, kind of regulate the industry, which we'll talk about later in the interview, uh, versus what, what they're trying to achieve. You know, are they trying to achieve renewable heating? Are they trying to achieve uh, transitioning workers from oil and gas and mining, you know, into renewable energy, uh, or is it rural economic development, or is it just, you know, how how fast can we get the emissions down? And and so, you know, when I speak to the government, uh, geothermal can do all of the above, by the way, including you know, maintain the electrical system, uh, not need to have uh, costly batteries or or backup for intermittent renewables. Uh, we, we can do all of the above, but we can best work with the government when they also have a goal that they want us to help support. And, and I think there's there's a disconnect now between uh, what, if any of those goals I, I just mentioned, are they trying to pursue? And then what these regulations are going to uh, like facilitate. Right. And, and I've talked to many experts in different jurisdictions, both in Canada, the US and Europe, uh, who make the point that policy and regulatory framework is absolutely critical to the advancement of many different forms of, of energy. You know, these, these new emerging forms, whether it's wind, solar, batteries, geothermal, whatever. And you have to get it right. So let's talk about the specifics of uh, geothermal resource development rules and directives 089 from the AER. What can you tell us about it? Sure. Well, I mean, yeah. First of all, congratulations to everybody who worked on the regulations. I mean, much like Alberta has you know, world-class regulations, you know, succinct, clear, you know, doable for oil and gas, they have done the same thing for geothermal. And there's a but. And 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 the but is kind of like like the hodgepodge because uh, when you do all those things uh, for oil and gas and you want geothermal to do them as well, we are operating in a different commodity and a different market. And so, uh, you know, every every one of your audience members will have uh, had the experience of taking a warm or a hot bath, it, which is my euphemism for a, a barrel of hot water. A barrel of hot water has different value than a barrel of oil. And, and yes, this, this province has seen, you know, the roller coaster of commodity prices up and down, but always that barrel of hot water is not worth a barrel of, of hot oil or, or just oil. And oil, of course, can be transported into a different market, maybe with different prices. But if you want to use a, that barrel of, of hot water, uh, you need to use it locally or transform it into electricity, which is even more money. You know, now, now you need like, a, like an upgrader for oil sands, but now you did electrical plant for geothermal and get it on a wire. Or you need to embed it into a service or good, a durable good that can be then shipped off if you want to compete with a higher price in a different market. And so when you have regulations uh, that are so thorough and and certainly are, are aimed at um, you know obviously safety first and, and conservation of resource. I mean things that, that Kanji is not going to disagree with, uh, but the policy people I think need to come back to the table. And I'll and I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, you know in these regulations now the province says uh, it is brand and this is just one example. You know it, it's brand new for us to be at these depths. And so we want the developer to uh, to take cuttings, uh, lots of cuttings, uh, and sometimes at the directive of, of the AER core, these are very expensive things to do, and and I don't think our industry would have any problem doing them, but we would like a rebate if if that's a provincially interested uh, piece of data, you know, then that, that we need to move on and have have the province chip in for things like that. So that's what I kind of mean by the hodgepodge. So if I understand this correctly, Allison, the, the AER has kind of 
looked at geothermal as if it were an established, well-established, profitable industry like oil and gas, instead of a, an emerging industry that has different requirements and and uh, needs uh, different kinds of support. No, oh, I, I wouldn't even call it emerging. This is just the, the difference between a utility rate of return. I mean, th this is such a common phrase in our vernacular, uh, you know, globally, if not North America, utility rate of return, you know, like 10%, uh, 8% versus a, an oil and gas rate of return that, um, you know, has sometimes wildcat wells or, or certainly, um, uh, you know, wells that don't work out an extra cost. So you get a higher return. We are always going to be utility. We are selling heat or electricity. And, and so those utility rates of return can't afford uh, all kinds of maybe extra or extraneous or even very, very thorough regulations. Uh, you know, and I think one one really kind of glaring hodgepodge example is um, we've talked a lot about these kind of oil and gas straw regulations and really no issue with them, except the part about getting to the resource, which is the surface access. They have chosen that one part to not be like oil and gas. They have chosen that to be like, uh, they call this renewable, like wind and solar, where you need uh, the landowner's permission. Uh, if you're on crown land, the AER will allow you to go to dispute resolution. That's very positive. Kanjia had suggested that if a, a landowner uh, won't give permission, that at least a dispute resolution should be available as well. And that's not available. And so are we really actually going to get projects going? Uh, we have this tilted in favor of oil and gas still, their access to the resource and tilted against us uh, for geothermal renewable. Now, I wonder, uh, in Alberta, uh, the industry, the electricity industry is regulated by the Alberta Utility Commission, and the Alberta Energy Regulator is generally oil and gas and related. And it seems like the there should have been maybe the AUC should have been co uh, collaborating with the AER to get these kinds of issues sorted out. Was that the case? You know, that, that's a, a really good point. And, and uh, I, I want to make sure the audience knows you don't always have to make electricity. You can just leave, you know, heat is heat and compete right against propane or natural gas or or diesel or, you know, or wood. Uh, but the AUC, I mean, that, that's another uh, issue we, we've had, you know, maybe for like five years where uh, there's areas of the province that uh, may require extra electricity lines because there just is a lot of demand now and not enough flow going in. Uh, you can't really put a wind or solar there because that would be intermittent and then you're going to need a battery. Uh, so what we've said to the AUC is tell us where those areas are that you need grid reliability. And even though it may not be the best geothermal, there is geothermal everywhere in Alberta at a certain depth. You tell us where you want us to build and we'll go and build a geothermal electricity plant there and save everybody's not in my backyard wires. And then guess what? After that electricity plant's built, I'm gonna have waste heat and some local entrepreneur, uh, you know, kind of for two for one capital cost can get some local economic rural development with that heat. Doesn't this sound like the AUC and the AER should speak together? I think so too. Yeah, it it sounds like uh, it it sounds and and let me back up a little bit. Uh, uh, provide a comparison here. Uh, last year, uh, over the last couple of years in in British Columbia, uh, the government has come out with Clean BC, and they're they're going to you know uh, increase electricity production, and and so then BC Hydro becomes responsible for that. And critics have said the, that the BC Hydro's um, integrated resource plan, which was released, I think, was earlier this year is inadequate because it didn't get enough policy clarity and policy direction from the government. And so then the reg, you know, both the regulator and the utility are kind of floundering a little bit, you know, trying to do what they were asked to do, but really don't have clear directions and to do it. And that leads, it leads to a hodgepodge, as you call it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like Alberta is kind of doing its own wrinkle with geothermal uh, in this instance. Well, as an intervener ourselves in um, the BC IRP, I know a lot about the context that you're explaining. Uh, but I mean, their their mandate, of course, is electrify everything because they have a big utility that makes electricity. And so BC Hydro is actually even giving out incentives to owners to do electric heat pumps. Totally fine. But an alternative to electric heat pump is a district heating. And, and that going back into Alberta, my one of my other concerns about the act is they define geothermal. 
uh, anything below groundwater. So no temperature like they have in BC or other jurisdictions. And that's totally fine. But let's play that through. If you just need simple heat. So I'm, you know, it's a summer day. Uh, and in our room right now, maybe it's 20 degrees Celsius. Maybe it's about that in yours too. Uh, the Banff hot springs are 40 degrees Celsius. So like 20 degrees Celsius is not like, like a hard temperature to get kind of anywhere in Alberta drilling. Uh, but if, if you want to go for that, just ambient heating and that renewable heat versus using a natural gas, but you've got to go through like all these regulations. Uh, and, and I don't want to call it red tape because I don't think it's red tape. Reporting uh, it's not necessarily red tape. It, it's overhead. And I, I, we're a utility trying to do the right thing for the small heat projects, a low depth, uh, low temperature, I don't think we can afford this as an industry. And so we're not going to get projects. And so the policymakers might be like, hey, like, you know, why, why aren't we getting projects? Uh, the, the fossil fuel industry may be cheering because, you know, they're, they're going to kind of maintain their market because there's no ac economic competitor. Now, normally what happens in cases like this is that the government consults extensively or the regulator consults extensively with the industry in question. And uh, we've seen this uh, in, well, I mean, it's just fairly common. Was there adequate consultation between the, the government and your industry and the regulator and your industry? And I, I love this question. I, I uh... No one was more surprised than than Kangia to see how many people, groups of people, groups came out and and uh, uh, you know intervened or participated. And uh, for such a, a small industry that no one really even kind of pays attention to for for the past decade, I'd say the incumbents came out in full force. And uh, I and by incumbents you mean like utilities or oil and gas companies those. And landowners or, you know, farming groups, I mean, every type of, of, of kind of organized group, but very few of the advocates and, and the promoters. And I, I think we've really, and I kept saying this to ER, you were really missing an opportunity to actually hear about the what we could do versus trying to like regulate us on, you know, what we shouldn't do or, or how we can do the things that we do. And so again, back to my comment about regulations and policy, maybe two different things, but I think the policy need, need to come back to the table. The energy minister needs to come back to the table immediately and say, uh, what are you trying to do for this industry? Because these regulations uh, may need to be there, but there needs to be some other support incentives and the voices of the incumbents uh, were, were very strong. And, and people like Kangia, I think we would have appreciated a capacity payment so we could bring that other side of what, what the industry looks like successfully in other jurisdictions around the world and, and have people see that part of it. Not, not so much the, you need to do this, you need to do this and you know try to avoid this. It, it, it's very uh, you know, regulatory versus uh, the, not, not a big focus on the benefits or how we can actually even achieve benefits using geothermal. Well, Allison, thank you very much for your insights, uh, and we hope that your your industry does get it sorted out because I think the uh, consensus is amongst the geothermal uh, interviews that I've done is that the industry is on the verge of a breakthrough, mm -hmm. and and uh, but in order to do that, I think everybody agrees there has to be a really good policy and regulatory framework in place, and it looks like this one maybe has some problems. So, thank you very much for this. Appreciate it, Markham.